series entitled Heart Habits, where we've been looking over the book of 2 Timothy, and we've been honing in on various habits that Paul has been telling Timothy he needs to take on. So a couple of weeks ago, we discussed the first heart habit, which was to fan the flame, in which we need to present God our tender hearts so that he can ignite a spark that will light our hearts aflame, and then we need to constantly be offering up our hearts, right, to the Holy Spirit to blow on our hearts and keep that flame alive. That was the first habit we talked about. And then the sec second habit we talked about last week was the habit of sharing the pain. And we went over the ABCs of suffering. How is it that we suffer along with other people and share the pain of those around us? And so we talked about the ABCs of advocating for people and being with people and committing to people who are suffering in the world around us. And so this week we're going to be going into our third heart habit. And this one is going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I encourage you to follow along with us. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And he's going to present our third heart habit. And we'll be reading that in just a moment. I want to begin with a question this morning. Have you ever had a, have you ever experienced a gap between what you know you should do and what you actually do? A gap between what you know you should do and what you actually do. I remember for a kid, for some reason, this happened to me a lot. I remember one thing specifically that I'm reminded of on this Mother's Day, uh, and it had to do with my mom. On top of our refrigerator when I was a kid, we had something called the candy bowl. Anybody have a candy bowl in their house? Man, you guys, some of y'all missing out. We had a candy bowl on top of our refrigerator, and this is where all of the candy from Easter and, and Christmas and hot, like all of that candy went into the candy bowl, and it sat there, right? Until someone would get the craving for candy, and then you were able to access the candy bowl if, and only if, you ask mom, right? <laughs> That's the rule. You can get candy, but you have to ask mom if you can get it. And I understood that to be the rule. I, I knew that was true. I knew these were the rules. I knew what I should do, and yet that's not always what I did, right? That's not always what I did. In fact, I thought the rule was ridiculous. I thought I should be able to get candy whenever I wanted, so I came up with a plan. And it was a great plan, and it was a five-step plan. Would you like to hear my five-step plan? If there's any kids in the room, you might like, you know, cover up their ears so we don't get any ideas. But here's my five-step plan. Step number one was to peek outside of your door to make sure the coast is clear, right? You got to make sure mom and dad are not in the kitchen. And once you've, uh, once you've looked into the kitchen and seen that it is clear, you can then move on to step two. Step two is walking to the kitchen, but you have to walk casually, right? You have to walk like there's nothing suspicious going on. Just go into the kitchen for a healthy snack. Something like carrots or spinach, right? And you kind of walk like you got nothing else to do. You know, nothing suspicious going on here. And then once you finally make it to the kitchen, step three is to drag the chair, right? The candy bowl is on top of the refrigerator. Despite what you might think, I was not this tall when I was five. And so you have to drag the chair, and you drag the chair uh, against the refrigerator. Now, this is a tricky part because many times the chair would make a screeching sound when you drag it, right? So it's a very slow process, right? Step three is slow. You got to take your time. You got to be patient. Drag the chair. You drag the chair. Once it's finally against the refrigerator, you can move on to step four, which is to climb up on the chair and claim your prize. This is where you step up and you reach your greedy fingers into the candy bowl and grasp as much candy as possible and stuff them into your deep pockets. I forgot to mention, you need to wear your biggest pair of pants when you do this, like the ones with the deepest pockets. You stuff your pockets full of candy, and then you can finally move on to step five, which is replacing the chair and returning to your room. Now, this plan went off without a hitch, sometimes multiple times a day, and um, it usually went fine, and I never got caught most of the time, but there was one day when the gig was finally up. I was in my room, and I heard the dreaded word that any child fears, and it's their own name, said in that way. And you all know what way that is, right? You know when your parents call your name when they need something, and then when they call your name when you're in trouble. And this was one of those times I was in trouble, so it was like that. I heard my name being called, and I went very slowly and fearfully, and I found my mother standing in the kitchen, and she was 
holding the candy bowl, and it was completely empty. <laughs> and somehow they found out it was me. I don't know if they ran fingerprint analysis. I don't know what they did, but somehow they found out it was me, and I was in trouble. And I wasn't allowed to have sweets for quite a while after that. And to be quite honest, you know, I probably deserved it, right? I deserved it. I broke the family rules, and I did something I knew my parents had expressly forbidden. I knew what I shouldn't do. I knew what, I, what was not allowed. I knew what I shouldn't do. And yet, that's the very thing I did. Many of us get caught in this same trap. We know what we should do. We know what we should do. And yet, that is the very thing that we end up doing. That was kind of a silly example, and it, uh, but the problem is, is this issue doesn't just end at childhood. Many of us, we know, we know we should not eat that whole tub of ice cream in one sitting, and yet what inevitably happens? We do it anyways. We know we should get up for a run, but man, my bed is just too comfy and warm this morning. Go a bit deeper. What about our spiritual lives? We know we should do our devotions, and yet there's always something else that needs doing. We know that we shouldn't feed our lust, and yet our eyes still wander, and we get caught up in things we shouldn't do. But we know that we should love our neighbor, and yet resentment and bitterness builds against them. We know we should be compassionate and patient and filled with joy, and yet so often none of these things describe us. And so we get caught in this weird trap where it seems like no matter how much I come to church, no matter how much I come to Sunday school, no matter how much my knowledge of what I should do grows, it never matters because ultimately I keep falling into the same traps again and again and again. We know what we should do, and yet that's exactly the thing that we don't end up doing. So my question for you is, what in the world keeps getting in the way? Why does this keep happening to us? We know we should do it, yet we never actually are able to do it. Here's the reason. The reason is, is because knowledge isn't enough. Simply knowing what you should do has never been enough. Why? Because of the overwhelming power of your heart. It all boils down to the overwhelming power of your heart. And this is why the whole series is named Heart Habits. Our greatest habits and our worst habits all develop from our heart. All of our habits stem from the greatest habit of all, the habit of love. Love is the greatest habit, and it's the most difficult to overcome. Love is the greatest habit. And you might be thinking, is love really a habit, though? When was the last time you needed to remember to love your husband or love your wife? When was the last time you needed to remind yourself, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to love my kids? You don't have to do that, right? Love is a habit. You don't have to think about what you love. Love is something we do without thinking, and so it's a habit. And it's, this is the exact reason why you do not do what you know you should do. It's all because your love is pointing you in a different direction. While you know that you should be following God's command, you know that you should be doing what he calls you to do. You should be loving and forgiving and living a Christ-like life. Ultimately, even though you know that, your love is pointing you in a different direction. And so you don't do the thing you know you should do. While many of us think that, yeah, I do love God, our hearts are pointing us in a different direction, and maybe that ultimately may not be true. Because sometimes the things that we think we love aren't really where our heart is ultimately pointed. Because whether you know it or not, your love is pointing you in a certain direction. Love is like a compass. Your heart will point you towards a certain direction. End. Your, your, your love, your heart will point you to what you really want. Your love, your heart, your, the compass of your heart is going to point you to what you ultimately desire. What you ultimately, what you really do want. And many times it's not at all what we thought it was. As Christians, we said, hey, if my love's pointing in the right direction, then it should be pointed at God. 
my heart's compass should aid me towards Jesus. And if I follow my heart's compass, then it would lead me to look more and more like Jesus. I know I should look like Christ. I know I should be obedient to him. And so if my heart's pointed in the right direction, it should point towards Jesus. And then what should that do? It should affect our desires. It should affect our wants. We should, we should be in communion with God. We should want him more and more and more if our heart is truly pointed towards Jesus. But what if your heart isn't pointed in the right direction? What if it's not pointed at Jesus? What if really you think that you do love God, but ultimately your love habit, your heart compass is pointed towards something other than God? You know what we call that? It's a, it's a word that we don't like to hear too often, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's called sin. Anytime our heart compass is pointed at anything other than God, that is called sin. And I want to stop right here because I just think there are so many misconceptions about what sin is in the church nowadays. We all have the wrong idea. So I want to clear up a few things. When we talk about sin, being tempted isn't a sin. Can we, can we, can we get past that hurdle? If you feel tempted to do something, you are not sinning. It's when you fall into temptation that gets you in trouble. But being tempted is not sinning. Jesus was, was tempted. So being tempted is not a sin. You know what else is a sin? Making an honest mistake. Being forgetful, getting in a fender bender, running a stop sign. You know, sometimes those are just mistakes and part of being human. They're not sins. It's just part of being human. You know what else isn't a sin? This one's a big one. Emotions are not a sin. You getting angry about something is not a sin. Now, what you do with that anger, that can sometimes get you in trouble. Harnessing that anger and holding on to it and letting it develop into a bitterness in your heart, man, that can get sin. That can become sinful pretty quick. But being angry at something is not being sinful. Being annoyed at something is not a sin. Those are just emotions that all humans have. That's how God created us. But they're not a sin. If you want to know how to define a sin, it's very easy. A sin is a heart that's aimed at anything other than God. That is a sin. It's when our hearts are aimed at anything other than God. When our heart compass is out of black, when our love habit is directing us at things that are, are not ultimately God. That is sin. That's the essence of sin. And let me tell you, this is why sin is so sneaky. This is why sin can sneak up on us and slip into our lives unnoticed. Here's why. Because all it takes is a heart that's just a little off true north. All it takes is a heart that's just one degree off of pointing at God. And what happens is it leads us away from a Christ-like life. It leads us away from God. It just takes one degree off. It just takes a little bit off of true north, off of God. Our hearts lead us in the wrong direction. It will lead us away from loving God and others with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Experts in air navigation have a rule of thumb known as the one in 60 rule. Have you heard of this? It's called the 1 in 60 rule. It states that for every 1 degree that a plane goes off course, it misses its target by 1 mile for every 60 miles you fly. It means that the farther you travel, the further away you get from your intended destination. What does this look like? It means that if you are off course by just one single degree, if you travel one foot, you'll be off by about 0.2 inches. Not that big of a deal, right? Not that big of a deal. But after traveling 100 yards, just one degree off, you'll be at, off by about five feet. You might still hit the runway. You might still be okay. Uh, but what about after you travel a mile? Then you're off by almost 100 feet. Just one degree was all it took. And if you travel around the entire equator with just one degree off, you will be almost 500 miles off target. And this is why sin can get the better of us so quickly and so easily, because the exact same thing is true of the compass that is our hearts. It just takes our compass to be one degree off true north. It's when our love habit isn't 100% perfectly affixed on God that we can find ourselves headed in the wrong direction. Just one degree off and your heart can take you out of God's will for your life. You can miss out on all that he wants to offer you and you can fall into sin. 
This is why it's so easy for us to know what we should do, and yet ultimately we fail at doing it time and time and time again. It just takes one degree. It just takes the cart's compass that's just a bit out of focus. That's all it takes. It's when our heart compass is messed up and our love is pointed in the wrong direction. That's when we begin to experience anxiety and restlessness. That's when we feel empty. Why? Because our heart's compass is pointing us at things that will never fulfill us. Our heart's compass that points us to love things that will never truly be fulfilling to us. And so we feel empty inside. After so much searching and so much scrounging, we still feel empty. And so it all boils down to this. A heart aimed at anything other than God equals sin. When our hearts are aimed at God, the heart habits that come as a result will always take us in a direction that we never intended to go. And so the question for us is this, what in the world do we do about it? Is it possible for us to recalibrate our hearts and make it perfectly set on God? Is that possible? How do we ensure that our hearts aren't even one degree off center? Well, I want to take us to our scripture this morning and maybe we can find the answer. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Where Paul's going to give us our third heart habit. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says this. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. And all the moms in the building said? Amen. Amen. Ungrateful, unholy. Without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Man, that's a laundry list, isn't it? You know what Paul's saying? He's saying, listen, this is what the last days are going to look like, Timothy. And keep in mind, for Paul and the biblical writers, they were in the last days. The last days were ushered in by Jesus. And so they were living in the last days, and we are living in the last days. And Paul says, this is what you're going to see. In the last days, this is what it's going to look like. This long, long laundry list of people who are lovers of money and boastful and proud and conceited and treacherous. This long list. This is going to happen in the last days. And who's it going to happen to? Who, who is Paul talking about here? Because if you read it, he's not talking about the pagans. He's not talking about the people who don't believe in God. Look at, that last, look at that last part of verse 4. He says they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Who's Paul talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about church folk. He's talking about Christians. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you know, they should have known better. He's saying they should have known, but they should have been loving God. But instead, they were loving all of these different things. They might say they loved God, but in truth. Timothy, here's what they actually loved. They began to list all these very different things. I mean, just look at how many times Paul lists the word love in that list. These are people who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, without love, uh, not lovers of good, lovers of pleasure. This was a love issue. This was a heart issue. I think if Paul could condense these lines down, he might say something like this. He might say, hey, Timothy. Just an FYI, in the last days, many Christians' heart compasses will be pointed in all the wrong directions. Their heart compasses are going to be off-center. So Timothy's big question had to have been the same as ours. He reads this long list, all of these Christians loving all of these different things, forgetting about loving God. What in the world do we do? How can we ensure that our hearts are pointed perfectly on God, not one degree off true north. We'll keep reading because Paul's going to tell him. Read what he says in verse 5. He says, these people, they have a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. They have something that looks like godliness, but they're missing the power. Have nothing to do with such people. They have something that looks like godliness, but 
They don't have the power. They're kind of just pretending to be Christians. They're pretending that their heart is pointed in the right place. They're pretending that they know God. They have a form of godliness, a shell of godliness, a mask of godliness, but it's completely void of power. There's no power found in this, Paul says. They say they believe in Jesus, but they must not know the power that was in his death. They say they understand that the Spirit came at Pentecost, but they must not know that with the Spirit came power. Because there's no change in their life. Their biggest problem, Paul says, is this. There's power available to them. And yet they've denied the power that God wants to give them. And as I read this earlier this week, I was just struck by the realization that maybe things haven't changed so much. I'm afraid that maybe things haven't changed. Because even today we have Christians who are still stuck in lives of sin. We have Christians today who don't know what it means to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. We have Christians, Christians, Christ followers who love themselves, who love money, who are boastful and proud and, and arrogant and ungrateful and unholy and without love. How is that possible? How does that make sense? What in the world has changed from Paul's day? I can tell you, I think that Paul was right. I think we're living in the last days. There are Christians today who have something that looks like godliness. But if you get a closer look, it's void of its power. There's no power. We've completely missed the power that is alive and well in the gospel. Do you believe the gospel has power this morning? I believe that, but we've somehow missed it. We have many Christians who claim to know Jesus and yet do not know the power that comes along with that relationship. I have a question. If there's Christians who are lost in sin and addiction and lies and lust and greed, my question for you is, Where's the power out of there? If we have Christians who are lost in sin, what power do we have access to that the world doesn't have access to? Where's the power? How do the saved live any differently than those who are not saved? Are you telling me that Jesus went all the way to the cross? He died and he suffered just so that you and I would continue to get tripped up in our sins. That's why Jesus died? Where's the power in that? Where's the good news in that? Is there any there? Did Jesus go all the way to the cross being tortured and die just so that at the end of our long life of tripping over our own sins and being lost in our sins, falling into the same sinful habits, one day we can be free? Is that why Jesus died? Where's the power at? Him? What's the point? Because if that's the case, if that's the kind of gospel we're preaching, I hate to tell you, but there's no power in it. There's no power in that kind of gospel. If that's the case, if there's no power in what Christ did over sin, then it's no wonder all these Christians were lovers of money and pleasure themselves. There's no real power in the cross. It's no wonder. There must not be real, any real power in the Holy Spirit because these Christians are just like the rest of the world. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. Else? Yeah. Where's the power in that kind of gospel? The good news is that Paul doesn't have that assumption. But when Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, these Christians who continue to live lives of sin, whose heart compasses are pointed at things other than God, have not accepted the power that is found in the cross. Paul says the cross does have power, and they've denied it. Paul says there is power in the gospel, and they've forgotten it. Paul says there was a purpose for Christ to die, and he gave us power that is available to us right now here today. And Jesus died to give us a power so that we do not have to continue in our sin. But Jesus died so that we could have victory over sin. Can I get an amen on that one? I thought that was pretty good. I don't know about that. Maybe I'll ask you about it. 
He died so that we could have victory over sin. That's why he died. It's the power he gave us. If you don't believe me, I want you to look with me in Romans 6 and see what it says there. It says this. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. We have died to sin. We have died to sin. How can we live it in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have life. Then look at verse 5. This is what he says. For if we had been united with him in a death like this, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. Here's the part. Verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Amen. So that, so that we may no longer be slaves to sin. Do you see power there? Do you see something that Jesus did for you and for me? It seems to me like we don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. That's what I'm reading here. So that we no longer have to be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died, anyone who has died. Has been set free from sin. Praise God. Hallelujah. We've been set free from sin. There is power in the death of Jesus. And that power is freedom from sin. We no longer have to be slaves. We can be set free. There's power that's available to us. So that we don't have to run after all the wrong things. There's power that God has given us. So that our heart compasses don't have to be even one degree off. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, there is more than just fake godliness. There's more than just pretending to be Christians, more than just going through the motions, more than just getting caught up in all the same sins over and over and over again. There's more than that. Paul says there's power available. And so Paul gives us our third heart habit. We have to fan the flame, we have to share the pain, but we also have to learn to accept the power. Accept the power. Every day, every minute, we have to accept the power that God has extended to us. Because if sin is a heart that's pointed in any other direction than God, then God has to be able to give us a power to point our compasses at him and him only. Does that make sense? He's got to give us a power to ensure that our hearts, the compass of our hearts, can be perfectly set on him. Not even one degree off. And I believe that it's a heart whose needle is perfectly set on God. I think that's what John Wesley called Christian perfection. I think it's a heart whose compass is perfectly set on God. It's what we in the Nazarene Church call Entire <coughs> sanctification. Now we get this wrong a lot. We think about this in the wrong way. Hear me now. I'm not saying that we are going to be perfect. You'll have your days on your journey of grace just like I have my days. You'll get things wrong. I'm definitely not saying that the spirit is 100% done with you when you're entirely sanctified. There's a long way for me to go. There's a long way for you to go. We got the Spirit has plenty of work to do on us. That's not what I'm talking about. But what Wesley meant by Christian perfection, what we talk about when we talk about entire sanctification, is that it is possible to have a heart that is perfectly set on God. It's possible to have a heart where the compass of your heart is perfectly set at true north and directed towards God, not one degree off. It really is able to do what Jesus commanded us to do. To love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why would he command us to do that if we can't do it? He'll enable us to do it. That kind of love is possible. That kind of power is made available to you today because of the love and the grace of God. And because Jesus died for you. And so if you're here this morning and you feel like your heart isn't quite set at true north. If your entire Christian life 
has been you knowing what you should do. And yet time and time again, getting caught up in the same sins and the same habits and the same pitfalls time and time and time again. You know what you should do, but you just can't do it. If your heart habit, the compass of your heart is pointing you in the wrong direction, I want to tell you this morning, there's power available for you today. It's available. You don't have to live a life of fake godliness anymore. You don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to pretend, but instead, there is a gospel that has power that is available to you. God wants to give that to you. So the question is, is how do we accept this power of entire sanctification? How do we offer up our hearts in such a way that God can point our heart compasses perfectly at true north, perfectly towards him? I know I'm already nearing the end of my time. I want to give you three quick, quick steps. The first step is that you have to be humble. It's the first step, and sometimes it's the hardest step. You've got to be humble. This laundry list that Paul gives Timothy has a lot of things in here about being boastful and being proud. These people who have their heart compasses out of whack, they were boastful, they were proud. There's no way they were going to admit that there was a problem. These were Christians who would probably have admitted they love God. Hey, I love God. There's no way they would have admitted that their heart compass was off true north. There's no way they would have admitted that they love after things that are not of God. This is why the first step has to be, has to be getting past our pride, being humble, admitting that our compass isn't at true north. That is the first step if we want God's power to invade our hearts and point us in the right direction. It's only by admitting that we are powerless because the first step in gaining in all, all that God has for us is by emptying ourselves of all that we are. It's only by admitting to God that we are hopelessly lost, that we don't have what it takes to correct our compass. It's only by admitting that to God that God can invade our hearts and redirect our hearts toward himself. It's only by admitting our faults and our hang-ups and admitting that we keep falling into these same traps again and again and again. God, I need your help. And he can do it. You can be humble. Oswald Chambers, he said this. He said, the moment we recognize our complete weakness and dependence upon him will be the very moment that the Spirit of God will exhibit his power. Do you believe that? We have to begin by recognizing our complete weakness and powerlessness, dependence upon God, that then his Holy Spirit can finally exhibit his power. We have to humble ourselves. We have to set aside our pride. It's only by dependence. So the first step in accepting the power and allowing God to fill us and reorientate our compass is by humbling ourselves, admitting that we need help, humbling ourselves before God. The second step, after we're humble and we lay ourselves down before God, if you would accept the power that God has made available to you and set your compass towards true north, the next thing you have to do, if you want to experience perfect love and be entirely sanctified, the next thing you have to do is be filled. You've got to be filled by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. Look at what Paul tells the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 15. He says, be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. In other words, what Paul's saying is, hey, make sure your heart compass is right on track, because the world is a tough place, and if you're even one degree off, make sure you're on track. Make sure your heart compass is pointing towards true north. And here's what Paul says. Then he says, instead... Make sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, hey, of Ephesus, here's how you can redirect your heart compasses. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to tell you, if you're here this morning and you realize that I've been falling into the same pitfalls again and again and again, I know what I should, should do, but yet that's never what I actually do. If you realize your heart compass is off true north, the first thing you have to do is humble yourself before God. But then you have to allow him to fill you completely with his Holy Spirit. It's the only way. 
His Holy Spirit's made available to you because of what Christ did on the cross. His Holy Spirit wants to fill you, not just a little bit, not just halfway. He wants to baptize you in, your, in his Holy Spirit. He wants to fill you to overflowing with his Holy Spirit. Every facet of your life, every facet of your soul, filled to overflowing with who he is. It's only after we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit that then we can truly love as God calls us to love. We can finally fulfill Christ's command to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength in our neighbor as ourselves. We can do that after we're invaded by the Holy Spirit and filled to overflowing. He changes our hearts. He fills us with a perfect love, and he points our compass straight towards him, perfectly towards him, not one degree off. The third step after being humble, after we've been filled with the Spirit, is we have no choice but to be changed. After you've humbled yourself before God and been filled with His Spirit, you will be changed. When we're filled with the Spirit and our love is directed at true north, it has to change who we are. Our old sins will be washed away. Those same pitfalls that you keep falling into are washed away. There's, you have power over those things. Our old habits die off. When we are baptized in the Spirit, we can truly live a life wholly devoted towards Christ. And it doesn't just end there. Lots more change to come. And God wants to continue to change you and change you and change you day after day after day. God still has work to do on you. He still wants to stretch you and mold you in new ways. There's things that God hasn't spoken to you or pointed out in your life that he won't point out in your life for another 10, 20 years. He still wants to change you. That's the joy of the Christian journey. It's a journey. Walking hand in hand with God, filled by his spirit, being changed to look more and more like Jesus each day. But on that journey, where is our compass pointing? It's pointing straight towards God. Not one degree off. The entire sanctification is just the calibration of the journey. The entire sanctification is God taking our compass and making sure it's pointed in the right direction. But there's still a whole lot of journey left to go. I want to ask that Beth would come this morning. And as we kind of enter into this final time, I want to address... One big misconception. You might be thinking this morning that when we talk about entire sanctification, that it means that God can do some work in you in which you are perfectly godlike. You might. You might. Um, you might be thinking that it's a big, big misconception in which. God might be, you might be thinking there's a big misconception that you might be thinking that God's going to make you perfectly godlike. That in one moment, there's no more work left to do. That you look perfectly like him. That you are in no more need of grace. You might be thinking that, but that's simply not true. What being entirely sanctified is, is realizing that your heart is off center and allowing God's spirit to invade your heart and point it perfectly back to him. And when you're entirely sanctified, let me tell you, it doesn't mean that you're in need of less grace. Can I tell you that? Whenever you're entirely sanctified, it doesn't mean that you're in need of less grace. But let me tell you, if anything, when you're entirely sanctified, it means that you realize just how much grace you need. That's what it means. When I'm entirely sanctified, I see true north and I'm walking towards it. But man, God, I need your help. I need the grace to walk this journey that you've set me on. It's realizing just how much grace I need to take every step along the journey. You're not being transported to some godlike, perfect state. It's not what it is. And I also want to make sure you understand that entire sanctification, our whole Christian life, it's all a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey with interacting with the grace of God in new ways. It's like a dance. And you know what? All of us are at different parts of the journey. Whether you were entirely sanctified a year ago or 20 years ago, we're all on different parts of the journey. If, if, if here is where I am, and over by Beth is what where Jesus is, what he looks like perfectly, 
we're all walking that direction. Entirely sanctification doesn't mean that when I'm sanctified, I get to skip to the end. Can I tell you that this morning? It doesn't mean that I get to transport all the way to perfect Christ likeness. That's not what it's about. But what it is, is when I'm entirely sanctified, now I know exactly where my compass is pointing. And I can continue to take step by step, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, step by step towards where God is calling me. I know that as I'm talking about this, there may be people here who say, there's no way this is true. There might be some people here who are pretty skeptical. 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 But don't believe it. No way. There's no way that I can stop being a slave to these sins that have held me down for years. There's no way that I can finally do what I know I'm supposed to do because ultimately I always get tripped up. I'll be saying that this morning. If you think it's impossible this morning, I want to ask you, do you think it's impossible because you can't do it or because God can't do it? Because if you think it's impossible because you can't do it, I want to tell you, you're absolutely right. 100%. You're right. If it's up to you to just quit bouncing back into your old sinful habits, you will fail every single time. If it's up to you to make sure that you're walking towards God, your heart compass will be off kilter. You'll walk in the wrong directions. You'll follow things you never intended to follow. It is absolutely impossible for you to do it alone. I want to tell you, it's far from impossible for God. Far from impossible. God wants to do a powerful, powerful work in you. He wants to completely change your heart and fill you with his spirit so that was what was impossible with just you is completely possible by the power of Christ through his spirit. He makes what is impossible possible. He can do that. Do you believe that this morning? Are you humble enough to lay yourself down? Are, are you ready to come and be filled with the Holy Spirit? Are, are, are you ready to come and be changed completely? Are you ready to leave the sinful habit behind you? Are you ready to finally die to that, well, that, that person of sin? Finally stop being a slave to it. There's power in the gospel available for you. Jesus died for a reason. There's power there. You come and accept. I'm going to ask Doug, can we sing it as well? We're going to sing just a few verses of it as well. If you're here this morning and you just say, man, I need God to just fill me up. I need my heart compass completely spun around. I need to make sure that I am 100% pointed at true north. I'd love to pray with you. If that sounds like you, as Doug, pray, uh, as Doug sings, would you come?